and thank you all for uh, coming out today, like I said, to, these, uh, to this late, uh, late afternoon session. We appreciate your time. Um, we know it's, it's busy uh, coming back from a, from a break um, and getting ready for finals. And that's really why we wanted to, to have these, uh, this kind of short series of workshops. Last week, we did a couple of workshops on what we called rethinking exams, where we, we, we challenged faculty to think just a little bit about ways they might um, break away from or adapt their, their current exams uh, to, challenge, to uh, assess students in different ways that might be more manageable and even less stressful. Um, and, but today we wanted to make sure we, we, this week we wanted to make sure we spend some time uh, helping faculty who, who do need to go forward with, with you know, online exams uh, to get past just the essentials, which we taught early on with kind of multiple choice and true false questions. And so we uh, asked Janice to, to put together this uh, complex tests uh, workshop. So. Um, I'm going to hand things over to her now. All right. Thank you, Jay. I'm assuming everybody can still hear me, right? Okay, great. And uh, as Jay mentioned, we're going to be talking about um, complex tests in Brightspace, and it is a follow-up to um, the test and quizzes workshop that we did. And um, there was some homework, so hopefully... Uh, you all got the confirmation email and actually looked at some of that. Because like I said, we are going to pick up where we left off from uh, that test and quizzes uh, workshop. And um, before we get into it, um, if you do tweet or use social media, I actually ask you to join the conversation about uh, educational technology you can use the hashtag uh, edtech, also um, the hashtag keep teaching Zula, and go ahead and tag uh, at ZulaCat. Um, and we're going to talk about some, but before we get into that, so when you're trying to create a quiz, a test exam in Brightspace, one of the first things that you are trying to do is figure out how to get the questions into the system. And so perhaps you might have access to a publisher's um, test bank that you might be using. And in which case, if you do, the publisher should have some information that explains to you how to get those questions into Brightspace. So that's where you would be looking for that information. But if this happens to be some questions that you have created yourself, uh, let's say you had a word processing um, you did it in a word processing document because you printed out a copy to give to the students in class. Now you want to take some of those questions and put them into Brightspace. And so that's where we are with trying to figure out how we're going to get those in. One um, software that we do have a licensed copy for, a site license at Xavier, <clears throat> is called Respondus 4.0. And this is different from the Respondus Lockdown Browser or the Respondus Monitor that you may have heard about. But Respondus 4.0 is actually for Windows machines. So if you have a Mac, you wouldn't be able to use it. They only have a Windows version. But this is a tool that might make it easy for you to be able to create your exams and actually upload them into Brightspace. If you're interested in this, you can send me an email and I can give you the download link and the license key that you would need. If you're following us on the cat food blog, you may have seen my blog post that talks about this test and quiz question generator that this uh, institution created. And so with this, you can also use this uh, if you have, say, questions, like I said, that you normally print out on paper and uh, to hand to the students because they're taking the quiz in class. You can take that uh, file perhaps and just do a little bit of reformatting of the questions and get this test quiz question generator to actually create a file for you that you would be able to upload into uh, Brightspace. So that is something else that you can uh, look at. And um, I wanted to drop a link, oh, I don't have it. 
I will get that for you. A link to the resources. Hold on just a moment. The link to these resources are actually um, also in the events description. All right, there we go. So in the chat, you should have a link to the resources that I'm referencing. You may have to copy that link and then paste it into, um, into a browser window. Did the link go through? Okay, great. All right, and so getting back to question types, the most commonly used ones are these, the true, false, multiple choice, uh, written response, and short answer. Likert is a question type that's available as well. However, it's only available in surveys. Of the question types, the written response one cannot be automatically graded by Brightspace but all of the other ones can be automatically graded by Brightspace. Um, and for, to simplify your workflow, you may want to, if you can, select a question type that would automatically, the system would be able to automatically grade for you. There are gonna be situations where, of course, that you would wanna use the written response, but just realize that, um, Brightspace cannot grade that particular one, but like I said, all of the others, Brightspace would be able to grade that for you. So what I wanna focus on today or this afternoon is uh, these some of these other question types, the multi-select and then uh, these others here. And we'll start with the multi-select. So with the multi-select, one or more of the answers are correct. This would be great if you have an like an all of the above or all of these apply type questions. So I have a, uh, an example of a question here that is um, multi-select. In other words, more than one or more options may be correct. And so here I'm asking um, students to identify which are prime numbers. And there's the list of them. If you're going to use a multi-select question, what is recommended is that in the question text, you do indicate that the students, uh, to the students so that they are aware that more than one answer could possibly apply. Um, also with the multi-select question type, you have some grading options. You can indicate that uh, all, they get all the points or nothing. So they would have to select all of them that are correct or nothing, there's right minus wrong or the correct answers. And so to, for those, like I said, uh, <clears throat> for all or nothing, they have to select all the correct answers and none of the incorrect answers. Right minus wrong, then you look at the um, right answers that they got and then subtract the incorrect answers and then that would be the points that they would get. And then correct answers, they would receive points for each correct answer and each incorrect answer that they left blank, right? Okay. All right. Then um, also with question types, certain ones have, um, you can use what's called regular expressions with certain question types. And a regular expression basically will look at the response that's given, and it will compare it against a set of acceptable values. So for example, if you um, entered as a possible answer choice, GR with an A and an E enclosed in square brackets and ending in a Y, then the system would consider the word gray to be correct if the student spelled it with an A or with an E. Likewise, here for color, we have the question mark um, or and then ending in an asterisk. So the student could actually spell this word with, uh, with the U or without, and either one of those would be correct, right? And so in that uh, list of resources that I, the link that I put in the chat, uh, there's a link to 
the information about uh, regular expressions. So if you're interested in that, you can see what um, some of those uh, options that you have for doing a regular expression. But let's take a look at a regular expression in, for example, a short answer question. So here's the question, a color of neutral tone between black and white, and so on and so forth. And so I'm indicating to the system that the student can enter gray, either spelled with an A or an E, in a lowercase g, or they can enter gray with an A or an E with an uppercase g. If you're going to use a regular expression as a part of the answer, then you have to indicate to the system that um, this is a regular expression. So you would select regular expression from this box. Now, with a short answer question, obviously the student can type, you know, whatever they want in the box. So if a student actually answered this question with a, a statement like, uh, the answer is gray, then the system is not going to realize that that is correct right? So like I said, the system will try to automatically grade it, but you know, you, you may have some, you may have to some issues where a student, if the uh, question was actually on a paper and you were grading it, you uh, would realize right away that if somebody put the statement, the answer is gray, that that is correct, right? So um, an alternative to doing a short answer question, perhaps, might be a fill in the blank. And so with fill in the blanks, you indicate the blanks that you want and then the text that you want, right? So here in this example, I'm indicating that I'm going to have a blank and then I'm also going to have some text following it. And I'm telling the system that in this first blank, I'm going to accept gray spelled with an A or an E in a capital G or with the lowercase g, if the student enters either one of those formats, then they would receive 100% of the points for this particular uh, fill in the blank question. If I'm using regular expression though, I have to make sure that I uh, click the radio button for regular expression. So here's a blank and then the text. And so this question would appear to the student in this way, blank is a color of blah, 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 right? Likewise, I can uh, I have another fill in the blank example here where I have a blank, I have some text, I have another blank and I have more text. So here I'm expecting that regular expression of the word gray with an A or an E and an uppercase G. If they enter this correctly in this blank, then they can get 50% of the points for this. <clears throat> I need to indicate it's a regular expression. In this blank, I'm expecting the word color, either spelled with a U or without, and they can receive the other 50% of the points, and I need to indicate it's a regular expression. And so here, the question would appear to the student blank, is a blank of so on and so forth, right? How are we doing so far? Any questions? Great. <laughs> All right. And then Tyra <clears throat> said she um, uses matching, which is great. So matching is a question type that's available. So um, of course, students can choose from uh, possible match choices and then they have to correctly pair them with match items. You can have more match choices than you have match items. However, the match choices are not going to be presented in a random order. If this is important, then you know you need to enter the match choices in a random order. And so um, in this example here, this would be match items. So this is um, identifying or entering, um, finding the definition of these words, right? So I have five items, but I have seven choices. What I'm saying is if it's important that this, the choices are presented in a random order, 
then you're going to need to put these in a random order because the system is just going to present these in the order that you enter. Right? Okay. Any questions about that? All right. And then you also have um, ordering question type. And of course, this is just arranging items um, in the correct sequence or order. And your grading options for matching as well as ordering, you can do equally weighted. So the total points are divided equally amongst the correct uh, matches. They can get all or nothing, or you can do the right minus wrong. We also have arithmetic um, question type, and you can assess their knowledge and comprehension of math and number theory. With this one, you can include variables so that you can ensure each student is going to receive a unique question. However, if you are, um, if, if the students have to demonstrate to you their calculations or show their work, then the written response question type is going to be a better option than arithmetic. And I have an example of this one as well. Here's the question. It says Johnny has X number of marbles, Sandy has Z number of marbles, and first name, this is a replace string, so this would actually pull in the student's name, has Y marbles, how many total marbles do they have? So I would enter the formula and basically here, I'm just trying to add X, Y, and Z. In my variables area, I would identify the three variables and then I indicate what is going to be the minimum and the maximum number for that variable. And over here, I can indicate the step. So every second number is um, a possible variable here, every fourth, so you can enter this. Um, and like I said, so the students will receive a unique um, question. And then uh, here, significant figures. Um, if the students have to do scientific notation, and this one here as well um, has variables um, that you can enclose in curly braces. And um, math is not my forte. So that's about all I'm going to say on significant figures. <laughs> There's a lot of information um, available um, at Brightspace's site that uh, if you're interested in this one, that they could provide you with. All right. And then with the HTML editor, so anywhere the HTML editor is available in Brightspace, you can actually insert equations in there. And there are four types of equations, graphical, chemistry, math LL, and the LaTeX. And so all of those are available. You would just go to the insert equations and then choose whichever one uh, you need. All right, and then um, the question library. So the question library is just that it's the repository where you uh, would store and archive all your questions so that you can uh, share them and actually reuse them over and over. Why use it? Well, you can uh, share questions between quizzes, surveys, and self-assessments. Also, if you're trying to pull from a pool of question or have random questions come in, then you're going to have to use the question library for that. So here's a question. How many of the same questions are two students likely to get when drawn from a question pool? Well, here's an example where in this table you see that uh, numbers of questions selected at random, this is repeating the same number of questions. However, what's different here is the pool size. Notice the larger the pool, the less likely these two students would receive um, the same questions. Only 4% of them would probably be the same. So the larger the pool, the less likely the students will have more of the same questions. And in uh, Brightspace, here's an example of a quiz with some random questions. 
And so here, there are actually 10 total questions in here, worth uh, 100 points, but they're divided into sections. So in this section, I'm pulling five questions from a pool of 65. In this section, there are three questions that are going to come from a pool of six. And in the last or third section, there are two questions that would come from a pool of 28. So you can, um, when you're setting up uh, pulling questions from a, a pool or random questions, you can, like I said, divide it into subsections so that you can pull in certain questions from certain pools and indicate how many of those uh, the student would get for the test. All right, and ways to encourage independent work. Okay, in your, in your test properties, um, on the properties tab, you have the ability to disable the right click, and then you can also disable instant messages and um, alerts. So in the Brightspace system, uh, there's an instant message button um, that you may or may not uh, realize is there. And so someone could theoretically be in the middle of a test and then just instant message someone else. So you can actually indicate that no, that's not available in there. Uh, you can also use question pools. Remember the larger the pool, the less likely two students are to get um, the same, a lot of the same questions. And then we also have um, Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus Monitor that is um, available and we talked about that before. But if you are interested in Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus Monitor, when you go to the Quizzes tab, you would see Lockdown Browser um, here, a link in the Quizzes tab, and that's how you get to the Lockdown Browser dashboard. Do I have any questions yet, Tiara? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Jay. All right, thank you, Janice. Um, and I just, uh, you know, w would want to emphasize, especially if you are, you know, concerned, uh, have, have worries about students cheating uh, with, with online tests. Um, you know, I think Janice has, has shown some good options that can be adopted, which I think are in many ways, I think probably a little more, a little more effective than the respondents lockdown. We, we, we have run into a number of problems with with students having the right kind of uh, setup at home or, or what they're taking the test on where respondents just doesn't work um, and so when you're relying on that technology to do it you can run into some real problems but some of these ideas about variables or random questions I think are is, is, a, is also a very effective way to kind of cut down and, and alleviate that concern um, as well but what we would like you to do um, for the next, let's see, I think we'll probably give you about uh, five or six minutes if I can, if I can uh, talk quickly through these instructions. Um, we're gonna put you into some breakout rooms and those of you who have done this, uh, been with us before know kind of how some of these breakout rooms work. If you don't, it'll be, a, a, I think a, it's, it's always an interesting experience to, to do it from the student end. Um, but we'll put you into some breakout rooms and in those small groups, we would like you to discuss and think about each person Think about maybe that uh, one specific final exam that, that you're starting to think about or worried about, or maybe that brought you to this workshop as well. Um, think about maybe the most complicated question that you've got on there, the one that you're really unsure about, how is that gonna translate uh, over to the digital field? Right? How is that gonna fit in and how's that gonna work in Brightspace? And then we would like you to discuss with the other members of your, of your group um, possible ways you might do that um, are some of the things that Janice was just talking about um, options. Are there other uh, question settings um, or options that would work for you? Or is there another way to kind of step outside of the quizzes tool um, to achieve that uh, kind of assessment as well? So I'm going to give each group um, five minutes um, to talk. Um, so I'm going to put it in as a hard uh, deadline here. And you're going to be pulled into your groups um, automatically. So uh, with that, uh, I will go ahead and open up the rooms and uh, see some of you in a little bit here. And um, in terms of the spokesperson, um, 
uh, it's going to be the person who is in the location. Is that, is that what we said? Location furthest away from campus. Closest. Um, closest to campus. Thank you. Um, the person closest to campus, physically, most physically closest to campus, will be the spokesperson uh, for the group when we return uh, to share out uh, what we discussed. So see you all there in a minute. If we can just take maybe five minutes to hear from, I think we only had three or four groups, um, just real quickly, what was maybe one question or one idea that came up um, during uh, your discussion? I'll volunteer. Well, Tyra, you got it? Go ahead, Tara. So I was in a breakout group with Janice and Ronald Doris. And I think the theme of our conversation was time, um, how much time to budget for questions, depending on how you're presenting it, if it's a quiz versus a final <laughs> exam. Um, Ronald was talking about multiple choice with all the questions viewed on one page. Um, but not wanting to give them so much time that they think that they can go and like open the book and find the answer because then the question will time out. And I had mentioned hearing, I don't know if I was a, a TA when I heard this, but that there's best practices or suggestion of how much time it should take a student to do like a multiple choice true false question so that you're not putting more items on and this is for even in class right uh, more items on an exam or a quiz right. than you actually have time um and so uh, janice was was unfamiliar with that but i was wondering has anybody else heard about like is it 30 seconds per question if it's multiple choice true false or because that's kind of how i always budget time for um yeah. What, what, I've, what I have heard with that, Tyra, because it really depends on the question type, right? It depends on, like, are all, like, are the scenarios in the STEM? Is it in the STEM and then just one little answers? Or is it the word in the STEM and then all the scenarios you have to read? So it really depends on the question. So what I have always heard, and this comes from uh, some of the work I've done with ETS, is truly read it and answer it yourself. Don't just know the answer and you know, move on. Truly read it and answer it yourself and then times it by two. Mm -hmm. So if the test would take you 20 minutes, then it should be 40 minutes for them. And I've looked at um, in the past, let's say I have a 30 item quiz. I look at the time it takes students. So the students who know it are done in like 15 minutes. <laughs> and then some students just sit there and use all of the time just because. So um, I've cut down my time in past semesters for quizzes after seeing how long it usually takes students to do that. Great. Thank you all. Um, let's see who else. I know uh, Tierra and... Uh, Janelle. Janelle, I know you, you all had some technical issues. I'm not sure if you had a chance to talk much. I'm hoping she'll say something now because what she was trying to explain was um, her motivation to get a quiz into Brightspace for what she was doing in her particular class. Mm. And then we started fighting with technology. <laughs> yes. It was on the uh, on rotation, and I usually give a pretest before rotation, and uh, it, it has a lot of short answers. So then I, and this was my first time using this quiz in in Brightspace, so that's when I realized that it doesn't grade the short answer. Even though I put all these answers in there, it doesn't grade the short answer for you. You have to then go back and and, and grade it. So it was interesting to hear what Janice was talking about, but I guess that still wouldn't work for a short answer. It's just when you have that one answer and if you're trying to, uh, like with the grade, with the spelling and all of that, so it, it detects and picks that up. But I was wondering if that was a way to use that so it could pick up certain words in the answer and maybe I can try that out or if anyone else has, you know, used the system for that reason. Because I know for me in pharmacy, yes, we give a lot of multiple choice, but then when it comes to rotation, I, I need to know that you know this information. And the only way that I can tell you can convince me is if you can write it out. 
you know, so that that's my preference. But I know, you know, in doing that with, you know, a large number, then, you know, it, there's a grading component that comes along with that when you give all of these mm -hmm. short answer. Um, Janelle, how many, how many people do you have in, in your rotation? Well, How many students are you talking about? Different with the rotation, because that's usually two or sometimes even three students. So that's not a problem. <laughs> yeah. But I just, this was my very first time. Okay. Using it. So it came as a surprise when, <laughs> you know, it yeah. was, didn't pick up these answers. And then it was funny because sometimes you're, I'm asking them to list. So give me four of the nine. Mm -hmm. And then depending on which or which answer I put in first, even though it's the right answer, if the student didn't put it as their answer choice first, then it doesn't give it correct. So it has to be in the exact same order that the instructor puts the answer. So again, I, I find all that very interesting, you know, within the last two weeks when I use it. But I mean, I, I will attempt to use it again and maybe do some things a little different. Mm -hmm. That's, we don't have a lot of time, but I mm -hmm. just want to, because I'm listening to your examples and I'm thinking maybe other question types for example, I hear you saying short answer. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what that means because I had to learn a difference between written response mm -hmm. and short answer oh. in terms of what that really is. But like when you say a four of the nine, maybe that'll work better as a matching. You may have more choices, but instead of making it a short answer, I don't know, just um, maybe other question types might help. Yeah, but I think you, you know, you were ask, kind of answer, asking, could, could it be set up so that as long as they hit certain keywords right. in, in their written response? Um, right. And I don't know if Janice, you've got a <clears throat> thought about uh, that as well. It, it sounds a little familiar, but I'm not, maybe I'm not uh, remembering correctly. No, unfortunately, short answer is not going to, just like you experienced, it's not going to pick it up because like you said they would have to actually enter it basically like you have mm. so yeah some mm. other way to format it or um get at it mm. might be okay. yeah. and actually just kind of in the sake of time i'll just kind of say for for our group before i hand it back over to janice that that was also one thing we talked about was the short answer and, and the regular expressions and trying to figure out where do you really want to spend your time? Do you want to spend your time kind of setting up those regular expressions so that uh, Brightspace can automatically grade those short answers for you? Or do you want to spend more of your time going back and looking at those short answer responses and manually deciding, you know, if the, if the students had them correct or not? So, um, but like I said, I think uh, Janice has some final uh, thoughts for us as yeah. well. Right, and the other thing I want to say too is that, um, if you look at building the questions as a part of your question library because you intend to use those later, then you know that investment in time, while it might be great now, it may pay off later. All right, and so yeah, Jay's right. I want to share my screen and, and do some final. Sorry, Janice, uh, Janelle had one more question, I think. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I, I do have another question. Um, mm -hmm. Even if I didn't, in a sense, build a question library. The questions from this first pretest that I created, would I be able to use those questions again if I wanted to maybe change up, you know, pretest version B? If I wanted to do it that way, could I use some of those questions again, or would I have to type those in again? Right. You can reuse the questions, but what you would need to do is go into the question library. Okay. And import the the questions from that pretest into yeah, the question library. And then from there, you'd be able to pull that in to uh, pretest mm -hmm. number two or, you know, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. All right. And so uh, some effective practices for quizzes. Um, build or create a, what I'm calling a quiz template. And basically this quiz template is going to have the default options that you usually use for a quiz. And uh, for example, um, if the quiz is normally 15 minutes, um, uh, if you, you know, usually choose can't uh, disable right click and um, disable instant messaging, those types of things, 
that are just going to be generic between all, uh, a lot of your quizzes, then just create that and call it a quiz template. When you're then ready to uh, create another quiz, then all you have to do is just copy that quiz template and most of the options that you need are already there. And then you can start from that point. And you may even have a couple of quiz templates, you know, um, but just, just as an option. And then here, um, as we were talking about, create your questions in the question library. But if you do that, organize them by type and topic. It's going to make it easier for you to actually find the questions in there. So when you go into the question library, think of it like um, a hard drive. So you're going to create folders, and then you would name them appropriately so you can find those questions later. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the question library will also allow you to uh, generate the random sections or pull questions from a question pool. Um, and then feedback, you want to provide feedback on the questions, especially if you're using this test <clears throat> as a formative assessment. And so the type of feedback would be con uh, continuous or sum summative, but it really depends on the length of the test, the complexity of the feedback, and the types of questions that are being asked. If you're providing feedback, it should be clear and should uh, describe why an answer is correct or why an answer is incorrect. So for example, if you look at this uh, example of this multiple choice question, here for the um, different answers, uh, it's indicated here why this one is incorrect and then why this is correct. So that the student is uh, viewing your, the feedback for the question, then this gives them more information as to why they went wrong. When you're building a test, um, you would actually click here under options and then you would see the ability to add feedback. Again, this may take some time to in, um, input feedback and questions, but if you look at it as I'm building something over time because I'm planning to use it uh, later, then that investment might uh, be valuable in the long run. Um, also, submission views. So you've uh, put feedback into questions and you want the students to be able to see it once they complete the test, then you're going to have to um, create a submission view. So this determines what the student is going to see when they view a completed quiz. By default, the student, when they take the quiz, all they're going to see is their score. So you can use the default view during the testing period, and then you can give them, uh, allow them another view of the test at a later period of time. So let's say, for example, after the testing period, you want them to be able to see the questions that they got incorrect along with the answers, then you can set up a submission view for that. If you are using these submission views, you do definitely need to provide the students a link with the instructions on how to view a completed test submission. And in those resources that link to the resources that I put in the chat, you'll find um, a link that um, has those instructions so that the students will be able to view uh, how to view a completed submission. And some better practices uh, for quizzes, preview all the questions that you create as well as all the questions that you import. You do want to make sure that they uh, import it uh, correctly or you created them correctly. Um, it's better to do that before you actually administer the quiz than to find out after the fact that you have some problems with some of your questions. If you use a text or an image information, make sure it's on the same page as your questions. If you decide to randomize questions, you want to make sure that uh, all the students get a quiz that is equally difficult. And so remember my example of the random questions, you can actually group questions by section. So if I had 200 uh, questions in my question pool and I just tell the system that I want the students to get 25 questions each, it is possible if I don't group them into sections that someone could get a quiz perhaps that 
uh, contains questions from uh, earlier material, which might be easier than later material in the course. So like I said, uh, utilize the uh, sections to make sure that you're giving students, um, all students will get a quiz that is equally difficult. If you're gonna randomize answers, make sure the answers are suitable for being randomized. So if you have an answer that says not all of the above, for example, or all of the above rather, then you don't wanna randomize that because if that appears as the first option in the list, then it's gonna be confusing as to what the student needs to, um, what the answer is. Um, also be transparent in your test instructions regarding the grading options. So if the student is gonna get all or nothing, for example, for answering or right minus wrong or just for the correct answers. And then the instructions go ahead and provide them with that information so they know how they're being graded. If you have a student that has a disability exception, then you would enter that in the special access section um, on restrictions. There's a special access and you can go in, for example, if the student is supposed to get uh, time and a half then you can go in and uh, indicate that that particular student has that extra time. And then there's quiz statistics that you can um, view uh, after the fact to help you identify if you have some problematic uh, questions and then you can take the appropriate next steps. And this is very important, practice test. So it's important for you, if you're going to give an online test in your course, that you provide a practice test to the students. So this test should simulate the actual test. So if you're going to have um, written response questions or you know whatever question types you plan to have on your test, then provide some of those in that practice test. So the practice test isn't really meant to be something that's difficult. The idea behind it is the student would get the opportunity to make sure that their computer is set up and they know what to expect when they're taking this test. So this practice test, the student should have unlimited attempts to take it and it should be available throughout the semester. It is very possible that the student may start off today using a, their computer and then something happens with their computer and then later on they have to switch to another computer. So they do need to have the ability to get to that practice test and be able to run through that to make sure that they're not gonna have any problems later on. All right, and I will end with the fact that, well, we're gonna answer any questions that you might have, but do expect an email uh, with the workshop evaluation. Um, we do value your feedback. And so when you get that, if you would uh, fill that out and, um, the form out and send it back to us. And if you have any questions, we will take those now.